Welcome to Stars and Swords. I'm Alistair Stevens. This week, we begin Daggerspell, the first book in the Devery Cycle by Catherine Kerr. In the first two chapters, we're going to be introduced to our cast of contemporary characters, and then flash back 400 years or so to see how this whole thing got started. As I mentioned in advance of this series, we're going to move fairly quickly through this book, and we're reading with a focus on what is, I think, some of the most interesting and certainly some of the most overlooked world building in all of late 20th century fantasy. Which is not to say that this book is always an easy read. I'll refer you to the content warnings in the show notes just as a heads up on some potentially challenging material. Let's begin, though, with the biography. Catherine Kerr is born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1944, but moves to California at the age of nine. She attends Stanford, but drops out in order to take part in civil rights campaigns in the late 1960s, continuing her education herself thanks to the San Francisco Public Library, reading extensively in literature and history with a particular focus on the Middle Ages. She credits her career in fantasy fiction to a friend who gives her, in 1979, a copy of Dungeons & Dragons, which leads her to first write adventure modules for the game, and then, in 1982, to begin work on her first fantasy novel, Daggerspell. The publication history of this book is a little strange, largely because it seems that no one expected the book to be as big a hit as it was, or for Kerr to write the subsequent novels in the series as quickly as she did. Daggerspell is released in 1986, with sequels in 87, 89, and 1990, which completes the first act of the Devery Cycle, Kerr's preferred terms for the series and the subseries set in this Celtic world. By 1994, four more novels have been published, completing the second act of the cycle. At this point, the first two books are reprinted as author's preferred editions, which are basically the only versions that you can get now. During this time, as if eight novels in eight years wasn't impressive enough, Kerr is also writing science fiction novels and a handful of short stories, as well as co-writing an official D&D adventure module. There are, as of the publication of the most recent in 2020, 16 books in the Devery cycle, and though it hasn't ever really received the recognition that I think it deserves, I think it's well worth our time and our exploration. In the last episode of the podcast, I offered a brief introduction to the political geography of Devery, to the history of the people who live there, and a guide to the pronunciation of the names in the book. So if you haven't heard that, I'd recommend you go back and check it out. The short version is this. Unlike most contemporary fantasy stories, which by the late 1980s had really settled into a Middle Earth meets D&D character sheet kind of conventionality, Kerr takes elements of Celtic history and myth and imagines a world in which a Celtic tribe flees from the expanding Roman Empire and takes up refuge in what is, in effect, the land of fairy. Over a thousand years, they establish their kingdom in this land of magic, complete with their own mythology, their own system of magic, their own gods and goddesses, and their own relationship, most importantly, with individual destiny. We'll expand more on each of these elements as we go on, but... In case you haven't read the book or you read it so long ago that your memory is not perhaps as fresh as it could be, that's the gloss that you need to get started. Let's begin then with the prologue. We're given the first epigraph here from the secret book of Cadwallon the Druid, quote, Men see life going from a dark to a darkness, the gods see life as a death, end quote. The use here of druid is interesting, and it anchors us immediately, of course, in the tradition of Celtic folklore, but it also keeps us at arm's reach in, I think, three distinct ways. There's the notion that the Book of Cadwal and the Druid is itself secret, so there is a hidden Gnostic knowledge. The character himself, Cadwal and the Druid, does not appear in this novel, or, to the best of my recollection, in the series at all, and much more importantly, perhaps, the word druid is only used in these epigraphs associated with Cadwallon. So this is an entire tier of knowledge, an entire category of knowledge and experience that is not directly available to us, but can only be reported by these short epigraphs, which I have to say are perhaps not the most impressive parts of the book. Though I would hesitate to say that that's unintentional. I think that perhaps something subtle here is happening. We'll continue to track the epigraphs as we move forward. Most importantly for now, though, the epigraph sets the stage for the prologue by introducing the idea that the nature of life, of human life specifically, is inverted depending on your perspective. By bracketing human life with darkness in the first half of the quote, and then changing perspective to that of the gods and equating life as a death, we're also equating life with darkness, with the absence of light, which is foundational to our understanding of the cosmology that Kerr is presenting. This is made all the more clear, all the more powerful, as we turn the page into the prologue proper and are introduced to the Hall of Light. Quote, In the Hall of Light, 
They reminded her of her destiny. There all was light, a pulsing gold like the heart of a candle flame filling eternity. The speakers were pillars of fire within the fiery light, and their words were sparks. They, the great lords of weird, had neither faces nor voices, because anything so human had long since been burned away by dwelling in the hall of light. She had no voice or face either, because she was weak, a little flicker of pale flame. But she heard them speak to her of destiny, her grave task to be done, her long road to ride, her burden that she must lift, and willingly. End quote. So it's interesting to try and parse exactly what is being presented here. Our protagonist, our little flicker of pale flame, has no face, no voice because she is weak. The lords of weird, on the other hand, have no faces or voices because they have resided here for so long that such human things have been lost. And it is perhaps ambiguous whether or not they possess them at all. It doesn't tell us that the lords of weird were once human, simply that they perhaps had faces and voices in the same way that humans have faces and voices. Before we start to break that down further, though, we should note that we are given here the essence of weird, the most important aspect of Kerr's cosmology. Weird, destiny, fate, the fact that there exists for you a purpose, that it will be difficult, a, a grave task, a long road, but you must choose to approach it, to fulfill it, to realize it. It's a burden she must lift and willingly. The and willingly is so important here because we're going to see, of course, characters caught between what they ought to do and what they want to do. But this distinction, putting the stress on being willing, tells us that we're not talking about duty or self-sacrifice or obligation or even an abstract sense of virtue. Willingly, we must take up the burden. We must be wise and understand that though this task is grave and though the road is long, this is the most important thing. And then, as Socrates would tell us, we will do the right thing because doing the wrong thing is only ever a product of ignorance, of insufficient wisdom. So already, if we're coming in with this basic understanding of weird, and if we don't have that, don't worry, because we'll get it in the rest of this first page, already the book is gesturing to the kinds of conflict that we are going to see. That though our weird is important, pursuing it isn't a sacrifice. It is fundamentally what is right. If we don't get that, it is because we are insufficiently wise. But wisdom, we can infer, is easy in the hall of light and perhaps more difficult in the world. Because after our protagonist promises to try to remember, she descends into the grey, misty land where the fog is composed of thousands of souls, of, we're told, spirits like wind. These spirits are human and far from the light and thus have faces and seem to also have voices. They are more individuated. Though they haven't ascended into the light, they also weep for the descent into the world. It's tempting to speculate that these are unfulfilled souls. These are people who have not taken up willingly the burden of their weird. But the same is also true of our protagonist, and she was certainly in the Hall of Light, so it's unclear what holds these souls in this space. Rather, I wonder if this is all part of the process, that these souls will eventually ascend, inevitably ascend. They will be purified, and then they will move on to the next stage of their life, possibly reincarnation. And perhaps one of the things of which they are being purified is the thing that they give to our protagonist as she descends through them, this sense of lust. This is a really interesting twist on morality, I think, and it speaks to Kerr's quiet power as a feminist writer. By the 1980s, it still isn't common to empower female characters in terms of their sexuality, and certainly not while respecting the ways in which sex and desire are dangerous to women. But here, our protagonist remembers lust before remembering any other experience of being human, which marks out lust and desire as being very important to being human as specific obstacles to taking up one's weird. From there, her spirit descends still further into experience, summer storms and rain and fire and food. Again, she remembers lust, this time embodied in a particular male figure, then water and her final descent. Quote, she wanted to break free and return to the light, but it was too late. The eddy of lust swept her round and round till she felt herself grow heavy, thick and palpable, there was darkness, warm and gentle, a dreaming water darkness, the soft, safe prison of the womb. End quote. So there's that darkness again, the opposite of the light, the embodiment which the gods see as a kind of death. So, on the one hand, we might speculate that the lust that she is feeling in that moment is directly connected to the moment of her own conception. But again, in a broader sense, 
It is desire that's presented as the greatest challenge to her task. We're given an inescapable sense that our protagonist, who will soon be born out into the world, is faced with the temptations of lust as an obstacle to the pursuit of her goal, but also, crucially, that lust is perhaps the most fundamental thing about being human, an inescapably necessary part of the process of reincarnation. There's that word again, and I wanted to avoid it for as long as possible, because reincarnation as a concept is attached very powerfully to some real-world religions, of course, and I don't want to read this book in the shadow of our theological and cosmological beliefs about the real world. For what it's worth, many Celtic traditions do allow for reincarnation of individual souls, though unlike Buddhist thought, for example, Celtic reincarnation has nothing to do with morality. Reincarnation was seen neither as a reward nor a punishment, just a transit of the soul. Some Celtic traditions also teach of an afterlife, another world into which the souls of the dead travel. Some believe that the souls of the dead move into trees, into streams and rivers, into other aspects of the natural world, many of which have spirits and essences all their own. And that at least is certainly going to be true of this book and the world that Kerr creates. So the problem is that reincarnation is a very loaded word. It carries with it a great sense of moral judgment, and perhaps even of moving toward a purified, perfected state. And neither of those things seem to be true of Devery. Neither of those things seem to be true of the cosmological structures that are presented here in the book. Although, perhaps they are, because we've already talked about how the gods of weird have had what was ambiguously human burned out of them by their time in the Hall of Light, and perhaps that is the state to which we all aspire. We'll maybe see more of that as we move forward. For now, though, we can set aside our protagonist, safe in her mother's womb, and follow the narrative as we switch both focus and tone. Quote, In those days, down on the Eldith coast, stretched wild meadows, crisscrossed by tiny streams, where what farmers there were pastured their cattle without bothering to lay claim to the land. Since the meadows were a good place for an herbman to find new stock, old Nevin went there regularly. End quote. So this land, this Eldith coast in those old days, this world is still wild. The tiny streams have not yet settled into rivers. The land is not claimed or owned or made civil. The herbman Nevin can still find stock, the wild and semi-magical herbs that he uses to ply his trade. We don't know yet how this wildness compares to the rest of the region or the kingdom, but we can be certain that this aged wanderer, who was revealed a paragraph later to be the most powerful master of Dwormer that the kingdom has ever known, is living on the periphery. We can also explore, based even on this very limited reading, the way that the classical elements are represented in this text. Our nameless spirit descending into the dreaming water darkness of the womb. The fact that Nevin exists in the wildness on the coast, crisscrossed with streams. Nevin digging the comfrey roots from the earth. The larks breaking cover and battling in the air. And finally, Nevin seeing in the sky the vision of the girl being born and looking straight back at him. We don't have enough to start drawing connections or distilling understanding just yet, but we've certainly been led to pay attention to how fire, water, air, and earth interact. So this is our cold open, with Nevin establishing the stakes. This isn't the first time the girl has been reborn. He has to find her before it is too late so that she can remember and listen to him. This presumably is connected with the promise she made in the Hall of Light to remember, to fulfill her weird this is already interesting stuff. Not many books begin by emphasizing the significance of a female character's personal destiny. This is one of the ways in which the book is going to continue to reject the standard practices, the, the tropes and the cliches of the fantasy genre, particularly in the 1980s. From there, we move into chapter one. Kurgany, 1052, seven years later than our prologue. We open with another epigraph from Cadwallon the Druid, this time an observation that the study of the Dwemer demands sacrifice over and over. And here, I think already, we're beginning to see that maybe these epigraphs are a little thin. It's contributing to our sense that in this world there are no easy roads, certainly, but it's also a little hollow as an axiom. There's no further information given, just the assertion that the Dwemer will cost you over and over. Really, though, we're here to meet our protagonist, and she is brilliant. This is Jill. 
Her introduction is fast and deftly highlights the specifics of the world around her while anchoring us in this heartbreaking emotional immediacy of the death of her mother. We open with Jill gathering wood, clashing with the ugly grey gnome, which then vanishes. The magical aspect of that encounter, though, is completely balanced by the mundanity of the tavern, of the back room, of her mother's deathbed. We're introduced to the priestess with the blue crescent on her face, and the narrative voice tells us that Jill prays to the goddess of the moon. We also learn that Jill's father is a silver dagger, and though it'll take a few more pages for the details of that to become clear, it's obvious from the beginning that being a silver dagger means that one is both itinerant and that one carries a certain social stigma, particularly from the priestess of the moon. And I know that we're here primarily to discuss the world building and the high level storytelling, but I would really be remiss if I didn't mention how much I love this opening scene. Jill is immediately, I think, a great, compelling protagonist, so different from the conventional farm boy protagonists of the era, Pug in Magician or Flick in The Sword of Shannara, or particularly and peculiarly Garion in Pawn of Prophecy. Jill has perhaps the most in common with the protagonists of Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea books, Ged from the first book to a certain extent, yes, but also Tenar, the protagonist of the second book in the series, The Tombs of Atuan. I haven't been able to find any interviews or articles in which Kerr talks about Le Guin, but it's very hard to imagine that there isn't a direct influence there. The most touching part of the opening for me is split in two. First, the part where Jill wishes that her doll, Heleth, is real, so that the doll can feel her grief and Jill can be brave and comfort her. And then, at the end of this very short passage, when Mackin, the tavern keeper, not knowing what to say to the child now in his care, asks Jill if her doll would like some milk, and Jill says, she doesn't, she's just rags. It's one of the most elegant and somber depictions of a loss of innocence that I can remember. So while we are talking about the high-level storytelling here in this book, I also want to draw attention from time to time to what a confident and emotionally sophisticated storyteller Kerr really is. So what's important to note about this opening as it's presented to us is that this is a low fantasy world. And in order to lay that out, in order to understand what that really means, we're going to have to do battle with the dark arts of genre taxonomy. There are people out there on the internet who will disagree with the distinctions that I am about to make. So my purpose here is to speak to the intent of the text rather than the most pedantic interpretation of genre lines. Technically, by some categorical standards, Devery is a high fantasy world because it takes place in a completely fictional land distinct from our own. This is the Lloyd Alexander definition from the late 1970s that has haunted us ever since. But what distinguishes high and low fantasy to the modern eye is a little bit more subtle. Yes, Devery is a fictional world, but within the land of Devery, there's very little magic around. The lives of the characters are rooted in recognizable challenges and obstacles, in familiar concerns like hunger and safety and desire. In this way, we can see Devery as being similar to, for example, George R.R. R. Martin's Westeros. Yes, fictional, but largely untouched by magic, and we can draw the contrast between that land and perhaps Tolkien's Middle-earth, which is infused with magic from its highest points to its lowest. And I do want to emphasize, I think, because this is a subject about which a lot of people have opinions and critical precision is a little fuzzy, A, neither high nor low fantasy is better than the other. Both have their uses, their virtues, their challenges, their opportunities. And B, it isn't really the presence of magic in the fantasy world which distinguishes between the high and the low, but the ways in which the presence of magic change the kinds of day-to-day -day experiences that people have, the scale and the tone of the story. Thus, is the Harry Potter series really low fantasy because it ostensibly takes place in the real world? Are the Discworld stories really high fantasy because Ankh Morpork is fictional? In both cases, I would say no. I think that Harry Potter is high fantasy because it is infused with magic, and the Discworld is low fantasy most often because it is concerned with the day-to-day -day trivialities of human existence. What we see in the opening pages of Daggerspell, though, is a world where, besides Jill's gnome, magic is all but absent. The Priestess of the Moon prays, yes, but doesn't cast spells of healing. The medicine that she offers Jill's mother is herb water, and neither can stave off the premature and achingly mundane death of Serian from a fever. This, then, is low fantasy, close to the ground, close to the characters, close to their complexity, and close to their humanity. From there, time passes, and the narrative voice elevates a little, and we get a broader introduction to the world of the story. 
Bobir is a town of 50 houses in the far north of the country and owes fealty to Lord Mellon, whose dun or fort stands about a mile distant. As I mentioned in the introductory episode of this series, the rank of Lord is the lowest of the feudal nobility, equivalent to a count in our own world. And of course, we get the introduction to the chief mechanic by which feudalism works and is perpetuated. Quote, Jill had always been told that it was everyone's weird to do what the noble born said because the gods had made them noble. End quote. And though that may be an anathema to most of us here in the modern world, we must remember always that the idea of social mobility is a relatively modern one. That said, we are going to be able to track through the rest of the book the degree to which that idea that it is everyone's weird to conform to societal expectations and demands is true, and the answer will be much more complicated than is presented here. The other thing to note is the scale of this community, and by extension, the world of Devery as a whole. When Lord Mellon rides into Bobir to visit the tavern, he brings two men with him for security. Bobir itself has 50 stone houses, which is half the number which Tolkien says can be found in the small village of Bree on the road east of the Shire. Throughout this novel and throughout the series, conflicts will be small and personal. When Cullen is hired to fight on with Tyrion Braith's forces against Lord Innes, it is because Tyrion Braith's warband is outnumbered four to seven. When Nevin meets Rodri Melwaith at the end of the first chapter, the boy is leading or being escorted by a warband of 20 men. This is compatible with our understanding of authentic medieval warfare, where armies were usually, by which I mean almost always, less than 100 men. It stands in marked contrast to the huge numbers casually thrown around by other fantasy series. 80,000 men fought at the Battle of the Trident during Robert's Rebellion in Game of Thrones. And that's by no means the most significant military engagement depicted in that series. When Cullen takes Jill to Averby, there are 200 houses there, four times more than her hometown. The population of Dundevery that were given in 643 is 20,000 people, which makes it comparable to London or Paris or Rome at the beginning of the late Middle Ages, around 1000 CE. But Dundevery, of course, is the only city of that size in all of Devery, suggesting that the population of the entire country is much lower than the real-world math would indicate. Specifically, and forgive me for the number crunching that is about to happen, Devery, according to the map given at the beginning of the book, is around a quarter of a million square miles, or about 650,000 square kilometers, which makes it about 20% larger than modern-day France and just a little smaller than the great state of Texas. Taking the population density of France in 1000 CE, even the lowest estimated level, would give us a population in Devery of almost 9 million people, which seems extremely high given the content of this book. We can infer, therefore, that much of this land is underpopulated, that the population density is much lower, as confirmed by the fact that Dundevery is indeed the only city of its size, unlike the six comparable cities in France at the same period. So this, too, tells us that Devery is a low fantasy world. Life is hard. Populations are small. Technology, economics, politics are all roughly equivalent to the Middle Ages. And the end product is that the story can more easily track every life, every individual, which is narratively necessary in a world in which an individual mercenary, a sole silver dagger prevented by law from congregation with others of his kind, can be valuable on the battlefield. So that's a gloss of the geography of Devery for now. Let's talk a little about Jill's relationship with the wild folk, and then we'll get to the arrival of Cullen of Kermor and the beginning of Jill's long road. Quote, When she called out to them, the wild folk came, her favorite gray gnome, a pair of warty blue fellows with long pointed teeth, and a sprite, who would have seemed a beautiful woman in miniature if it weren't for her eyes, wide, slit like a cat's, and utterly mindless. End quote. So these are the fairies of the world of Devery, and we've already seen some different sorts, some different species, perhaps. The gnomes, which would seem to include the warty blue fellows, but also a classic Tinkerbell fairy, beautiful but inhuman. We may be able to make something of the fact that the wild folk to whom we attach masculine pronouns are, so far at least, universally ugly, while the Tinkerbell fairy is described as beautiful. Later in the second chapter of this week's reading, we're also going to get a reference to the wild folk of the Aether specifically, which is probably enough, given our focus on the classical elements already described, to speculate that the different kinds of wild folk may belong to or be associated with different elemental houses, which makes sense for Jill's gnome in particular, which is described as smelling like fresh-tilled earth. <laughs> 
So perhaps the gnomes are earth, the the sprite that we see here may well be air, which is a common classical association, or could be perhaps ether, the fifth classical element, ether connected to the heavens, to the divine. We'll pay attention to it as we move forward. Jill thinks of staying with the wild folk in the woods, a thought that she finds, quote, as frightening as it is comforting, which makes sense because the realm of fairy is not, of course, meant for mortals. But it does perhaps also speak to Jill's wisdom, her intuition here, her perspicacity perhaps, but certainly a sense of what is and is not right. Mackin's comments about Jill talking to the wild folk are also interesting, positioning the wild folk as a myth that children believe, something that adults are broadly tolerant of, perhaps even amused by, but definitely do not believe, or if they do believe it, it is because these wild folk are attached to witches and dark sorceries. Jill's ability to see them and talk to them is something she keeps secret, just like the true dream that heralds the eventual arrival of her father. Which is all for the best, as Cullen makes clear later in the chapter, warning her that those who see wild folk are oftentimes considered witches and can be put to death. Speaking of Cullen, he is an interesting character, but perhaps not an easy one. We ought first to define the role of the Silver Dagger, the itinerant mercenary who has dishonored himself and thus dropped out of the feudal system. No one is responsible for the Silver Dagger, which means that the Silver Dagger can enjoy none of the, albeit very limited, social safety nets which exist in this culture. He exists outside of decent, honorable, strict society. That gives him, of course, a certain degree of freedom. It certainly gives him, in Cullen in particular, a certain notoriety. But it means that there can be no direct integration back into ordered society. We'll note, too, here the extra detail about the world building that we get from Selian's grave. The oak grove is dedicated to the god Bel, the god of the sun and the king of all the gods. This seems to be an evolution of the real-world Celtic god Belenus, who is associated with fire, right? It's the same linguistic root that gives us Beltane, bright fire, the May Day celebration marked in Scotland and Ireland and Wales and around the world. It's interesting to note that in real-world religious tradition, sun deities are usually male, though not always, and are almost always paired with a moon deity of the opposite gender, as seems to be the case in Devery too. right? We've got Bel, the god of the sun, and the goddess of the moon, who is so far unnamed. I mentioned in the previous episode the legend that we were given about the original Deverians fleeing the Romanes under the leadership of King Ran. When we're given that exposition here in the first chapter, it is presented as a confirmation of Jill's discovery of the pleasures of life on the road. She is Deverian. They have loved to wander for long ages. She's so taken with the experience that she tells her father she wants to be a silver dagger when she grows up, and he responds by telling her, hey, I know this isn't a standard fantasy novel, Jill, but still women don't fight. Jill, though, protests. Quote, why? That's not fair. Besides, there was Lady Guinevere, too, and she was only back in the time of troubles, not the dawn time. These men insulted her honour, and she gets them for it. Jill laid her hand on her heart, just as the bard did. Back they fall, and bright blood blooms on helm and heart as the hells claim them. I learned that bit by heart. End quote. Minor spoilers for future books, but we will actually get to meet Guinevere in the second book in the series, and it's one of my favourite stories that we get. The point, though is that there aren't female warriors in Devery, except when there are. And again, we're seeing this emphasis put on personal destiny, a greater emphasis than is put on societal convention. And throughout this part of the book, through Cullen and the story of Guinevere and the upcoming clash between Braith and Inith, we're emphasizing the importance of honor, of, of standing, of playing your part in society, but also of being true to yourself. These two responsibilities, to society on the one hand and to your own destiny on the other, are going to give a lot of structure to the stories that come. And we're going to get a swift tour of the problems with the feudal system, with that societal structure, as Cullen takes up employment with Tiran Braith over the matter of swine rights to an oak forest, very conventionally medieval there. Abrin the boy tells Jill first that lasses are always scared and that her name is a bondwoman's name, that is a servant owned by someone, what was known as a serf in the real world medieval period, the lowest rung on the feudal ladder. You were protected by those above you and societal expectation demanded a decent standard of living, but you were not free. In any case, Jill punches the kid, and then they rather charmingly make up, which I like. This sequence is demonstrative of how constrained the politics of Devery are by the rule of law, but also by the sense of honor. When Cullen sends the pigs from the forest seeking to remove the excuse for violence, he is nonetheless caught up in the fighting 
because he dishonors Inith by knocking him to the ground. After the battle and the death of one of Braith's warband, Cullen and Jill talk about Weird. Quote, Jill began to feel better. Thinking of it as Weird made it seem clean again. It's the only honor left to me, my bargain with the Weird, Cullen went on. I told you once, never dishonor yourself. If ever you're tempted to do the slightest bit of a dishonorable thing, you remember your father and what one dishonor brought him, the long road and shame in the eyes of every honest man. But wasn't it your weird to have the dagger? It wasn't. Cullen allowed himself a brief smile. A man can't make his weird better, but it's in his hands to make it worse. End quote. Even the gods, we learn, are subject to weird. They cannot intervene to change what must be. So Jill, thinking of this death as a part of the man's word, finds that it feels clean. It is no longer inhuman, animalistic, disordered. It is no longer violent. It is a part of the world as the world ought to be. And what's equally interesting here, I think, is Cullen's take on the concept of weird, that it can be made worse through dishonor but can't be made better. You can't fight it. You can't dodge it. You can't run from it, but you can make it worse, as presumably he has done, distinguishing between his skill as a warrior and the life of a silver dagger. His fate would be the same. That is, death would still come for him if he served in a warband at the command of a Tyrann or even a Guerbrot, even the High King, we can imagine. But it's all the more difficult because as a mercenary, he doesn't even have the comfort of honor, of principle. He will fight and die for money, for the basic necessities of survival, rather than for something beyond himself, something grander, something greater, something that is more contributive to society. From there, we cut away to Nevin, who has spent the last seven years wandering around, trying to find Jill, trusting to the luck that's more than luck, the guiding of a person to their destiny. Then we meet with Lord Rodri Melwaith of Aberwyn, a handsome young ten-year-old boy who is returning home after the death of his brother. Nevin recognizes him, or rather the person he used to be, Blaine, a lord of the Boar clan. And that's what triggers our flashback and the book's most audacious structural conceit. We're going to continue to jump around in time. We are going to see how these souls have entangled themselves around each other in life after life with the narrative that we followed so far functioning effectively as a framing device. This chapter set 400 years earlier in the year 643 is almost double the length of the opening chapter, which I know is a daunting thought and certainly gives me pause about the length of the episode we've had so far, but we've covered a lot of the necessary world building already so we can move with purpose into this earlier time period. One thing to watch, as I mentioned on a recent Stars and Swords bonus episode over on Patreon, that's patreon.com slash next word, where you can pledge a few dollars a month and get access to all kinds of bonus episodes and extra shows. Something I mentioned over there on a recent Q&A is how carefully Kerr depicts the passage of time and evolution, the maturation of this society. Fantasy worlds in general don't change. They're basically static. We inflate periods of time in the same way as we inflate every other aspect of these fictional worlds in order to communicate grandeur, import, power, in order to impress the reader. You know what's cooler than a hundred years ago? A thousand years ago. Kerr, though, was a student of medieval history and knows that societies change, that languages and customs evolve over time, and that is going to be realized in each distinct time period that we visit in this series. So, 643. We begin with Cadwallon again, telling us this time that the mistakes of a man who, quote, claims the Duomer are carved in stone and will endure. Claiming the Duomer is an interesting phrase, and we're going to take several linguistic approaches to describing the relationship between Duomer masters, those who are called to the service of this force, the utilization of this force, the wielder of this force. And, you know, it's not an accident, perhaps, that I'm using the word force there so conspicuously because it doesn't feel completely antithetical to the sense of the universe that we are given in George Lucas's Star Wars series. We'll continue to track how Dwemer is used and manifests itself without the consent of the Dwemer master. As we begin the chapter proper, though, we are introduced to Gaurian, a young prince of Devry with a talent for the aforementioned Dwemer, and Regor, his teacher. Gaurian is betrothed to the very beautiful Brangwen, but doesn't care about anything as much as he cares about the Dwemer. Quote, he hungered after it and thirsted for it, end quote. In this way, and in several others that we'll see demonstrated, Gaurian sucks. He's a spoiled son of a royal house with no concern for his feudal responsibilities for the future of his country, let alone for his friends and his betrothed. 
400 years before the stable devery that we see in the first chapter, the country is far less settled. There isn't yet the resilience, the stability that comes from long-term social momentum. We see this in Dwen's traditional mounting of the head of his enemy over the gate and the tension between the old ways, as exemplified by that ritual, and the new, as exemplified by the modern Deverian priesthood. Worse still, Gowian is self-obsessed. He doesn't really see Brangwen. He misreads the signs of coincidence and fate. He believes that he has been led alone to the Dwemer. He's blind to the fact that Brangwen too has a destiny. The subtlety of this is really quite lovely, and then we land it as hard as a gut punch from Rhaegar right at the end of this chapter. Kerr stays close enough to the various points of view that are presented here that their arguments, their internal justifications, can begin to feel compelling even when those characters are at their worst. This breaks a little, perhaps in the on-page descriptions of Brangwen. It's difficult to tell how much our sense of her, particularly in these opening scenes, is colored by Gowrian's borderline contempt for this young woman. She has not been educated. She does not understand politics. She giggles incessantly. This is a girl who is special, to our point of view character at least, because she is the most beautiful girl in the kingdom and for no other reason. Now, this isn't true. Throughout this week's reading, Brangwen demonstrates that she is tougher and braver and more honest and more loyal and and perhaps most importantly, capable of as much emotional sophistication as any of the men around her, possibly excluding the very heroic Blaine, of course. It is difficult to track exactly who Brangwen is, because she is not the focus of the narrative voice, because Garion's POV is so selfish. When the turn comes and he suddenly realizes that he truly loves Brangwen, it's severely undermotivated on the page because he is just not given to the necessary self-examination to track that transformation, if indeed it is a real transformation, within himself. He is a selfish little prince. So let's gloss the plot of this chapter, and by extension, the plot of the whole series. This is our inciting incident, after all. Galrion and Brangwen are to marry, but Galrion wants to study the Dwemer and abdicate his place as the third son of the High King. He's so interested in the Dwemer and in his studies that he even thinks he can hook up Brangwen and the genuinely good Blaine, head of the Boar Clan, who is the sworn blood brother to Geraint, head of the Falcon Clan and Brangwen's brother. Everything falls apart when Galrion is first imprisoned and then exiled by his father, the High King, and is renamed Nevin, which means no one. Geraint takes this opportunity to cancel the betrothal because he wants his sister all for himself. Grieving for her father and for Gowrion, Brangwen finally surrenders to Geraint's sexual advances and the two sleep together, agreeing that they will have the summer together and then kill themselves in the fall. Brangwen is pregnant, though, and the gossip is beginning to spread. In the end, Nevin goes to save Brangwen, and Geraint has a moment of lucidity after killing his sworn blood brother Blaine and sends Brangwen off with Nevin. But Brangwen's touch of the Dwemer is sufficient to show her the death of her brother in a vision, and she takes her own life by drowning herself in the river. Rhaegar tells Nevin two things, that souls return after a time in the other world, and that he has a huge debt to pay, because his selfishness, his weakness, his ignorance led to the deaths of these people and the thwarting of Brangwen's own weird. He rashly makes a promise that he will make this right no matter how long it takes. His oath is accepted by the Great Ones, the powers behind the gods, the powers behind Weird, and that sets the stage for the rest of our story. These souls will be reborn again and again until they each possess the wisdom, guided hopefully by Nevin, to take up their Weird willingly and fulfill their destinies. It's a very unusual story construction for a novel like this. The structure isn't quite unique, but novella-length flashbacks which underpin the frame story in the present That's not a common approach to a fantasy world. What's much more important than the structure of the story itself, however, is the kind of conflict that we are going to see moving forward. We'll get our fair share of villains, certainly, and it's fair to say that the fate of the kingdom will certainly hang in the balance, but this is a world in which self-awareness and judicious wisdom and humility are key virtues, are more important, perhaps, than slaying the dragon and saving the princess. The taking up of one's destiny may not be glamorous or easy, but it is the path of wisdom, and avoiding it or being ignorant of it leads only to violence and despair. Let's move on then to consider the Dwemer a little more carefully. Let's look at some specifics. Quote, Gowrion had Rhaegar's permission to display one small trick to persuade his father. He raised his hand and imagined that it was glowing with blue fire. 
Only when the image lived, no matter where he turned his mind, did he call upon the wild folk of Aether, who rushed to do his bidding and bring the blue light through to the physical plane, where it flared up and raged around his fingers. Adaric flung himself back, his arm over his face as if to ward a blow. End quote. So this is our first practical description of what it is like to practice, to wield the Duomar, to cast a spell in a much more conventional parlance, I suppose. And it's fascinating because we will get many, many more examples of this in the future. And we will really delve into the mechanics of the Duomar in a way that we do not delve into the mechanics of most magic systems in most fantasy worlds. But here we get already the core idea for this kind of magic visualization and then the manifestation of that vision by appealing to the primal forces which underpin reality as manifested in the wild folk. As we see throughout this reading, being open to the Dwemer, though, is a two-way street. Yes, you can wield it, you can use it, but it also has access to you in the form of premonitions and visions, the ability to read omens. There's some really sophisticated writing in this chapter in which something will be experienced by Galleon or Nevin and given a little bit of explanation. And then a similar thing will happen to Brangwen without any explanation at all because she herself is unaware of the Dwemer or her raw talent, but feels it nonetheless. This is most powerfully realized and made most explicit, of course, when she has the vision of Camlan, Blaine's brother, killing Geraint at the same time that Nevin is watching the scene unfold in the fire. So the Dwemer is power, but it's power anchored in talent and in knowledge and in understanding and in a vulnerability to the underlying forces of the universe. There's a reason we might speculate at this point that the magicians of this world are Dwemer masters, that the verb there speaks to dominance and mastery rather than just power and strength. And we might speculate that it is that power, that sense of dominance that is most attractive to Galrian as we meet him at the beginning of the chapter, quote, or as he thought about it during his damp ride through the forest, wanting the Dwemer was a lust, a burning inside him. Once he'd thought he lusted for Brangwen, but now a new lust had driven that passion out. End quote. So here we see a little complexity layered into the idea of lust as the primary thing which must be overcome in order to pursue your destiny. Lust here first for Brangwen, which would have complicated his own pursuit of the Dwemer, of course, but then the lust for the power itself, an unwise desire that is really the cause of what will lead to all of these tragic effects. Luckily, we get a case study for what happens when one surrenders to this desire, to this lust, to these deeper passions. We get... Geraint and Brangwen. The emotional arc here, I think, is interesting. Geraint, we know from very early in the chapter, has long had feelings of desire for his sister. He is disgusted by himself, as is evident when he talks with the severed head of his family's old enemy mounted above the gate and the reason for the priest's curse against his clan. Quote, I'm the curse, Geraint said to Samaric. I'm the curse that God sent to her clan. He sat down on the ground and wept. End quote. The grief that Geraint feels at his father's death, which is also perhaps too acute, too intense, and suggestive that his wisdom and self-awareness are generally insufficient rather than being focused exclusively on Brangwen. The grief that he feels is an excuse to indulge that passion further, that desire further, first by postponing both her wedding to Galrian and his own to Isola, who is completely innocent in the affair, it seems, and then by breaking his sister's betrothal after Galrian is exiled. Quote, Galrian knew that Geraint was lying, that all these fine words were cruel, deadly, poisoned lies. The Dwemer was making him tremble and choke. He bit his guard on the hand, but all he got for his effort was a blow to the head that made the world dance. End quote. We might wonder why the Dwemer is fighting so hard in that particular moment and whose weird it is protecting. We might also wonder if Brangwen's resistance is caused by that same feeling. Brangwen will later say to Rotha, quote, My pardons, my lady but you don't understand. I know I should have gone. End quote. When Blaine comes to Brangwen to say that he will postpone his offer of marriage for a whole year, she replies, quote, I will then, if we both live. End quote. She knows what's coming. And the surrender into it, and this is crucial, I think, the surrender into it gives her a false sense of power. Stepping forward into the inevitable can feel like you are making a choice, even though you aren't. So Brangwen submits willingly to Geraint's desire, but then immediately expects to die by her own hand, if not by his. But he is stronger, and he takes that escape from her, too. The second time, she feels, quote, her desire rise to match his, a bittersweet lust born of despair, end quote. 
So we have our lust, of course, but the last word is the most interesting. Despair comes to us from Latin via the Old French. Des meaning without and sperare meaning hope. Despair, therefore, has exactly the same root as desperation. The distinction here, I think, is that in despair, we take no action. We are paralyzed. And in desperation, we take any action available to us without wisdom. The choice that Brangwen makes here is what seals her fate, no matter what Nevin does to intervene. The choice to embrace her death, even if her fate is so curtailed by circumstance and by the dark desires of her brother that there is no good outcome available to her. We might be reminded of what is said by Cullen earlier. A man can't make his weird better, but it's in his hands to make it worse. Speaking of which, there's another kind of layering which takes place in this book, particularly if you've flipped to the back of the book, and that's where the glossary is, so it's not impossible that you have done so, and you've glimpsed the table of incarnations. Jill is Brangwen reborn. That much would surely be transparent to the reader at this point, regardless of the table of incarnations. Rodri, we've been told when Nevin meets him, is Blaine. Rotha is Lovian, who we haven't met yet, but who is in both lives Blaine slash Rodri's mother. In this life, Isola, who was Blaine's sister and was supposed to marry Geraint, is Jill's mother, Sernian, which is appropriate in a sense, of course, because, and this is where the tension comes in, Cullen, Jill's father, is the reincarnation of Brangwen's brother, Geraint. This, given Cullen's predisposition to violence and dark brooding and incestuous obsession, may well give us some serious pause about Jill's safety in the present of the story. So in just the way that the tangled relationships between these characters are echoed and reflected in each subsequent generation, informing their own responses to each other and the debts that have yet to be settled, and that, as we'll see later in the book, doesn't even take into account the other lives these souls have lived, in the same way that these characters are caught in knots of interpersonal drama, so we as readers can feel those same patterns being played out, being laid out, we can feel the same storms on the horizon. Ultimately, we conclude this week's reading with Brangwen's death and Rhaegor's explanation about reincarnation and Nevin's rash promise to make things right. And if we're talking about world building, as we somewhat intermittently are here on the show, then these pages encapsulate, I think, the biggest ideas that the book has to offer. So let's study how this unfolds and what it can tell us about the world of Devery, the, the world of Anun, I guess, and what the book wants us to pay attention to as we move forward. Quote, it was close to nightfall when Nevin reached the hut in the forest. Rhaegor came running out and stopped, looking at the burden in the saddle. You were too late. It was too late from the first day he bedded her. End quote. I'm not sure if it's something about Kerr's narrative voice specifically, or if it's something that's inherited from the slightly inflated, slightly grandiose style of fantasy at the time, but I find myself fascinated by the use of negative space around these characters, the way that the narrative voice resists the urge to disambiguate, to clarify, to contrast. Does Nevin believe what he says when he tells Rhaegor that it was too late from the first time Grint and Brangwen had sex? Because... Buddy, by the time that happened, we were already a long way down that road. And I can understand at this point in the novel if the reader was feeling a little uncertain about the way the book is asserting its morality. It is possible to read these pages as a real victim moment for Nevin, or at least an invitation to extend our sympathies towards a man who has made terrible, selfish decisions with awful consequences. Had he either been strong enough to honor his promise to Brangwen, marry her, and then abdicate his place in the succession? they would both be living with Rhaegor in the woods, pursuing the Dwemer, as Rhaegor says is intended by the weird. That's option A. That's the one that ends well for everyone. And even if that's off the table, because Gaurian is too selfish, he wants magical power more than he wants Brangwen, if he had been strong enough to give her up completely and go to Blaine himself, then Brangwen would at least be safe. So, Anchoring this consequence, this, this effect, in the cause of Geraint having sex with his sister... It's morally transgressive, of course, but it's not the first domino to fall. So I understand a reader rolling their eyes at this point because the book doesn't go out of its way to offer reassurance that Gaurian was the worst and Nevin, while perhaps incrementally better, still is a long way from good. Ultimately, to jump ahead, not just to the end of this book, but to the rest of the series, I will say, you just have to trust me on this, that we're in pretty safe hands. I like the way that most of these stories wrap up, but even without that external reassurance, I do think that a careful reading shows a story that is putting an unusual emphasis, a critical emphasis on agency. 
on choice, on the inner life of the people that we love or the people that we hate as something which exists distinct from ourselves and always on the consequences of our actions. And we can see that given voice here in this scene through the very useful perspective of Regor. Quote, The poor lass, Regor said at last, she had more honor than either you or her brother. She did. Would it be a wrong thing for me to kill myself on her grave? It would. I forbid it. End quote. Rigor then lays out the mechanics of reincarnation in this world, a death in which one world is a rebirth in the other, and then lays it out, giving Nevin the verbal slap that he so desperately needs. No, I will not allow you to die, because dying will not solve anything. It will just kick that can further down the road. Quote, You failed her, lad. I'm half-minded to turn you out, but that would only mean I'm failing you. You're going to make this up to her, and the burden won't be an easy one. Maybe it sounds pretty saying you'll meet again, but think about what you owe her. You little fool, you should have recognized her. End quote. You should have recognized her. Awareness, then. Knowledge, then, of both the self and of others. Setting aside what we want in order to see what is. These are the most important traits, not just for Dwemer Masters, but for anyone who wants to meet their own word on good terms, to take up that burden and to help others do the same. And for all that Kerr is leaning into the quasi-historical feudal social structure across Devery, and for all that this is still a fantasy book, so we're going to be focused on the most powerful and dynamic characters in the world, there's something very balanced and egalitarian about this sense of destiny, of word. It is different for everyone, but everyone's is equally important. Something to think about as we move forward. And we can think, too, about how nobility and rank are presented, about how we can compare the way that Blaine and Geraint rule over their households, how Gaurian's father rules as high king, how Gwerbret Madoc, very quietly one of the best characters in the book, oversees the lands of both Blaine and Geraint, and how he treats his own responsibilities toward those in charge, and his guilt, his shame for his failure. Finally, we should talk a little about Nevin's promise specifically, which is a perfect extension of the ways in which the book talks about promises, oaths, and the sworn word of an honorable person in general. This is accurate to many communities in the Middle Ages, including the Norse traditions, Anglo-Saxon traditions, and of course Celtic traditions too. Swearing an oath is a way of spending or investing social currency, right? Of, of leveraging one's public and socially validated honor, worth, reliability, I find it interesting that Nevin's oath, for all that it feels to be that same kind of promise, the same kind of promise that we see over and over again in that chapter, it works out a little differently. Here he is making the promise, so he believes, specifically to Brangwen. That's who he's calling out to. But the promise is instead accepted by the lords of the weird, the great ones, the three thunderclap knocks, three being a somewhat significant number in Celtic mythology, as embodied in the symbol of the, the Triskelion, right, the triple spiral. The Great Ones are demonstrating an authority to take Nevin's offered promise and accept it on behalf of Brangwen, presumably because they are the Lords of Weird, and this atonement is now a part of Nevin's destiny, too. We might be able to unpick that as we move forward. So Nevin's promise is made, and as we know from the first chapter, he will now spend the next four centuries at least trying to fix things, and trying to lead Brangwen to the Duomer that is her fate. Let's see how that works out, starting with next week's reading. And we've got a bit of a complicated reading ahead of us, because chapter five of this novel occupies fully half of the book, so we're going to have to split it in half. So next week, chapters three, four, and the first half of chapter five. That's Devery 1058, beginning when Jill is 12 years old, Devery 698 for the first reincarnation of Brangwen's spirit and Nevin's first attempt to make things right, and everything in chapter five, Eldith 1062, when Jill is 17, up to the point where Jill and Nevin meet for the first time. That's when we stop. When Jill and Nevin meet for the first time, we will conclude our second week's reading. The week after, we'll move into the rest of the story. Really, we'll meet and confront our actual active villain, the nefarious Lothlane. That's going to do it for this week. As ever, if you have thoughts or questions or comments or insights, rash promises that will forever change the course of our weird, you can email starsandswordspod at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram at starsandswordspod, or you can help support the podcast and get more bonus episodes and join what is, quite frankly, the best and smartest community on the entire internet by visiting patreon.com slash nextword. I don't advertise this show or run ads on this show because advertising on the internet is a terrible thing and our time is valuable. So this show is possible only thanks to your support. And if you pledge your support at patreon.com slash nextword within the next few days, 
you'll be able to vote for the next book that we cover in this series. The poll is live right now, and I'm excited to announce that we are going to be covering some classic 19th century novels, all of which this time around are English. Presented in chronological order, then, well, in one of the best one-shot careers of all time, we have Emily Bronte's 1847 novel Wuthering Heights. It's an undisputed classic. It is charged with romantic, gothic, even borderline erotic energy. In Heathcliff, Bronte creates one of the most complex characters of all time. It is a classic for a good reason, though the same could be said of all the books on this poll. In 1861, Chapman and Hall published the collected edition of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, this gothically inflected coming-of-age tale stuffed full in that Dickensian way of the hauntingly grotesque and the achingly human. Our third option is considered by many to be the single best English language novel. George Eliot's Middlemarch, published in 1871, weaves together four separate storylines to create a nuanced view of a world poised on the brink of modernity, of transformation. It's a dense, complex read, and we would have a lot to dig into. Lastly, and possibly my personal favorite, Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd was published originally in 1874. It was his breakout novel. It has all the sweep and grandeur and fragile human dignity that we associate with Hardy. It is a brilliant book. Bathsheba Everdeen is one of my favorite heroines in all of literature. You will not regret picking that one. You won't regret picking any of the books available on that poll. So if you would like to cast your vote, patreon.com slash Next word. And if you're concerned that there's a conspicuous absence, if you're concerned that Jane Austen is nowhere to be found on that particular list, don't worry. It's because I'm waiting for a dedicated Austen series later in the year. So patreon.com slash next word. Support the show. Cast your vote. I'll be back next week with the second reading from Daggerspell. Until then, after a few weeks of writing with her father, Jill realized that the lure of the road had caught her too. There was always something new to see, someone new to meet. She wondered how she'd ever endured being confined to one small village. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.